Hello everyone and welcome to the Cambridge Creatives Q&A with Hussein Amini. I'm Ellie. I'm Hannah and we're the founders of Cambridge Creatives. We're a student-run creative collective curating a series of talks with world-renowned professionals in film, TV and theatre. So please follow our Facebook page to find out more about future events. Just a couple of housekeeping rules before we begin. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, please type them in the Q&A function, not the chat function, which is somewhere down there and we will read them out for you. One, bear with us if there are any technical difficulties, and two, let us know in the chat if there are any problems hearing or seeing us. And most importantly, enjoy the Q&A. So just a quick introduction for our guests for this evening. Hussein is an Academy Award nominated screenwriter and director. His adaptation of Henry James's novel, The Wings of the Dove, was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Writing Adapted Screenplay. Hussein also won the Best Adapted Screenplay Award for the Austin Film Critics Association for Nicholas Winding's Reference Drive. For his di directorial debut, Hussein both wrote and directed The Two Faces of January, an adaptation of the Patricia Highsmith novel. We are honored to have this prolific writer and director speak. So Hussein, my first question for you is, when did you know that you wanted to be a writer or even a screenwriter? Um, I actually wanted to be a director, which is probably a really embarrassing thing to admit to, but um, I, writing was just a way of, uh, you know, I wrote a short film when I was at university just to direct it. And then, and then when I got into the industry, the moment I got offered work as a writer, I sort of put the directing aside and I sort of regret not having sort of pursued it more. I, I didn't direct until I was in my 40s. So um, one piece of advice is if you want to direct, then, then stick to it. But, um, but writing has been great fun too. And were you ever involved in theatre or even film while you were at Oxford? Yeah, I directed quite a lot of theatre at, at Oxford and, and I, di I directed a couple of short films as well. Uh, and it was fantastic. Sort of, I mean, that, that's what really, you know, I'd, I'd always loved cinema, but there was a fantastic, um, there were two uh, rep cinemas at Oxford when I was there. And, and you could literally go and watch, I don't know, Bergman, three films in a row, Kurosawa, three films in a row. And, and, and I used to do being a bit of a film nerd. I did that all the time. So, so I was, as well as being involved in, in sort of making stuff, I was also, it was just a fantastic education to go and just watch those films, which I, I think it's how much harder to get to see those now on, on a big screen. Yeah, definitely. Do you find that you studied history while you were at Oxford? Did you find that your degree prepared you for your future projects because you've adapted several novels into period dramas? Well, it's really helped me with research. And actually, research, I, I often choose a project because it sort of interests me as, as an old sort of historian. So if, if it's, I mean, because the world building in film is something and, and screenwriting I really love. And, and for example, if it's a Western to be able to read about the gold rush or, or you know, Klondike fever and, and, and you know, the role of women in the West. So suddenly I, I sort of, I'll read dozens of books like I did at universities when I was studying history. And so I, I sort of quite often will go, is, is this a project or a subject that I can spend a good three weeks kind of reading three, four weeks from sort of researching and, and reading books. And, and, and often that will tempt me because it's just, you know, it's a great thing about screenwriting is you get, you sort of get to be a paid student for, for as long as you can. Yeah, it's a great way to look at it. How did you get into the industry? What was your first job out of uni? Was it related to what you do now or was it something else? Um, do you know, I was, I was quite lucky because I, I, I sort of did a short film uh, university, which won a student film prize. So I got an agent out of that and that sort of stupidly made me think that I could, you know, get a job straight away uh, in film. And um, it, it took about three or four years, which isn't a huge amount of time before I actually got paid to do it. But I had, my brother was a, um, he was a, oh, actually he was a war photographer. So he'd, he, he'd so I'd sell him, he was my younger brother. So I'd, I'd sell him my terrible amateur screenplays. Um, and, and sort of, you know, he, that, that was how I sort of got by for a while. Um, and, and then the first job I got was at the BBC. Um, which was, you know, to write, you know, they commissioned me to write something. Um, Perfect. And then how did your sort of career develop from there, from the BBC? Um, I was quite lucky because the first, the first sort of TV thing that I wrote that got made um, got a BAFTA TV nomination. And at the awards ceremony, weirdly, I met Michael Winterbottom, who then offered 
Me Jude, which was like a, a movie adaptation of Jude the Obscure. So, so I, I sort of, having struggled for about four or five years and not earned anything, I, I was very lucky that it all happened quite quickly for a while. And, and then, then Wings of the Dove came and the, the Oscar nomination stuff. But then I had a really, I, I sort of worked for, I had an exclusive deal with Harvey Weinstein for six years. So I literally nothing I wrote got made. Um, and so it's, it's ups and downs My, it, it, with every career. I think, I think you start off thinking it's this upward trajectory, but, but the really important thing is, is I think to be sort of grounded enough to know not to get too carried away when things go well, and not to be too despondent when they don't, because it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's really up and down. Um, and, and you see, I, I've sort of come across a lot of particularly young directors off of, off a hit. And, and there's there's an arrogance and a um, complacency that sort of fits in. And, and you know, the second films often don't work. And then then the industry is incredibly cruel, particularly to directors, because it's very hard to get to make a film if something you've done hasn't worked. Yeah, have you ever, has that ever happened to you? Have you ever had anything that's just fallen really flat? Oh, all, all the time, but but it's, it's, it's not, somehow as a writer, you're not, you know, you're not that responsible because I think between the screenplay and the final film, so many things happen. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I also sometimes, you know, a lot of the stuff that I've done that hasn't worked, they've either been rewrites of something or someone's rewritten me. So, so the, the, the blame for a writer gets shared a lot more than it yeah. does. And, and also studios who've hired you don't really want to blame you because they're the ones who greenlit your script in the first place. So they don't, they'll go over. So usually the director gets the blame, unfortunately. Hmm. And do you have any, other advice to give to students who would want to follow in your footsteps? Did you go to film school or did you sort of learn just by doing? Watching films. I, th I think you sort of, that's probably the best film school. And I think lots of films would make you do that anyway. But I think just the more you watch, you sort of absorb the film storytelling language. So, so I think a lot of, for example, first time screenwriters, I mean, one, the common mistakes tend to be, they write the whole scene. So from someone entering, to someone walking out of the room and that ends up being four or five pages which is too long for a scene in a film really and I think one of the best places to learn is in an editing room because you suddenly learn very quickly that what you don't need but also that you can actually come in there's, a, there's an amazing shot in um, um, Blue is the Warmest Colour where they literally just show her sleeping and the camera just sort of crowds around and whatever and it tells you more about I don't know it's just that that's how cinema works those silent close-ups are often far more powerful or again when she's sitting and there's the you know she's sitting by the bus staring out and it allows you to read into their thoughts and that's what cinema does that I think no other art form does is that that idea that you can you can guess what people are thinking uh, and that intimacy and, and and that that's that's something that an editing room can teach you that you can literally just cut to someone for a moment and, and you need to write that in the screenplay mm. um, so sometimes a three line scene can be the best thing in the screenplay yeah definitely speaking of other art forms you've adapted several novels what do you look for in a novel that would make it a good adapted screenplay um well not the quality of the writing weirdly i, th I think i think sometimes that could be very seductive and um, you know, obviously the story, the, 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 the thing that I've always done with books is if, if it's a book that, there, there are some books that you read and every reader has this where you feel no one has felt the same experience and that same emotion. You feel like you're the only person in the world who's really understood that book. So I, I take back what I said earlier, that is a lot of that is the writing. Um, but, but the idea of um, then trying to capture the reading experience is for me the adaptation because it's, it's almost if, if you're trying to put the book down on paper as an adaptation what you're really doing is just transcribing and it's just taking and fitting and it's not as whereas if you're trying to convey your experience of the reading thing so for example sometimes if I was bored in a section of a book that's probably the bit I'm most likely to skip in an adaptation or if I was heartbroken in one moment everything will come around to that and I'll feel that's the key moment. So, so, so that idea of, you know, I generally tend to read lying on a sofa. So to, trying to get, recapture that moment is really key for me. 
Um, How closely do you work with the novelists, obviously the ones that are still alive? Um, it's like Drive and our kind of traitor, the, the writers were still alive. Do you work with them in the adaptation or uh, more of it? With, 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 with Drive, actually, the, the, the author, um, it's, I, it's a wonderful book as well. Just, just, I don't think he was, it was a studio, it started off being a studio film as well and studios tend to keep the writer away. It wasn't through choice. Obviously, with the Carré and our kind of tracer, it was, it's a different thing because he he is the most powerful person in the production. Um, and I had a wonderful kind of three days uh, working with him on the script. This is before the directors came on and stuff. So that that was probably my happiest moment because then you know, I worked with one director that I got on really well with, and he he was replaced, and then I didn't get on so well with the next direction. I wasn't really wild about the film in the end, but but the experience of spending three days working with the carré on, you know, his book, um, but but also how how flexible he was in terms of changing things and dropping things and adding things. Um, so I think I think he loves film, so he's quite he's quite a good person to work with in terms of those adaptations of his books. Mm. Did you find that there's more freedom in adapting sort of 19th century novels like the Henry James or the, the Thomas Hardy? Well, the, actually the two 19th century ones I did, they were very different because the Henry, Henry James sort of writes scenes uh, in the sense that you can pick up the book and read it and go, actually, that's quite a simple scene to get down it. You know, Sue does this and Drew turns around and walks away and they have some dialogue, which he writes. The Henry James adaptation, which I did, is, is much more internal. Um, and so there really aren't that many scenes. So what was interesting about the adaptation of Wings of the Dove was it, it sort of his characters are so psychologically well drawn that when you finish reading the book, you feel you know them so well that you can just invent scenes and still be true to the book. So I'd say even though a lot of that was, you know, those scenes that just don't exist in the book, but I think they're very true to the characters. And that's really because Henry James's characters are just so perfectly meticulously drawn and stuff. So they, they were they were very, I felt more free with the Henry James because it was, there wasn't, um, I didn't feel I had to tick off scenes like I did slightly with, with, with Jude where, um, you know, you, you, you keep some scenes and you leave out others and then, you know, people who love the book will go, oh, they left out that bit, that bit. And, you know, so that, I felt less free doing that. But no, not in terms of the authors. I, I, don't, I, I, think, I think you always have to feel free. Yeah. regardless of whether that author's alive or not. So do you find that actually writing original screenplays is actually quite similar to your adaptation process if you're sort of inventing scenes anyway? Um, yeah, I, I sort of do the same thing. I mean, I've got a very boring way of working with it. If I read, a, if I'm adapting a book, I'll, I'll do it on cards, those ones that you get in Romans, and, and I'll go through every scene in the book first and sort of put down short you know, short two line, what the scene is about. And then I'll put the book away and I'll just use the cards as a rereading of the book. So I'll kind of go, oh, hold on, this card is a bit repetitive because you start to see structure more when you do that. So I'll go, oh, this scene is a bit like the scene before cards down. So I'll get rid of that one or I'm kind of missing a gap here. There's a, there's a sort of something missing here. I need to fill that in. So I'll write in a new card. And, and so the cards become the sort of beginning of the adaptation. And, and sort of writing originals, it's the same. It's for me, it's become the same thing. It's about it's about cards. I, I just that that's my. Lots of people do it on whiteboards. Other people do it on notepads. I, I definitely, you know, because it's. I, I think what it allows you to do is is and particularly because film is a sort of rhythmical flow more than anything. It, it's that that if you can quickly go through it rather than getting stuck in, you know, one scene. And um, I think I think. Um, there was one, one screenwriter who used to, when he used to do his out, his beat sheets for scene by scene by scenes, he'd actually judge how long, how, how, how many minutes each scene deserved before he even started writing. So he'd sort of go, they meet, that's only like one minute and go, well, the love scene, that's four minutes. And, and that became his way of trying to, um, I, I think rhythm is often more important than three acts or five acts or whatever that stuff is like, everyone goes on about. Sounds like you have a, a very personal writing process. Do you prefer writing independently in, or like in comparison to writers' rooms, like TV shows or other films? Um, 
I, I love writing on my own, but I, I, I love the collaborative process, whether it's with other writers in a writer's room or with directors and producers. I think, I think the act of going away and sitting down and bashing it out, I, I sort of want to do that on my own, but then to show it to people or to discuss it before you go away and write, those things are really important. And, 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 and that's actually the joy of screenwriting is you have a lot of collaborators. Sometimes it becomes incredibly difficult because they can change things to the point where it becomes unrecognizable. Uh, and, and that's another skill you learn is how to take notes because you, you invariably, you know, and every screenwriter who's starting is gonna have this, there's gonna be people telling, you know, giving you notes that you really don't like or you feel are gonna destroy what you've written. And the art of being able to apolitically manage that, but also creatively to go, okay, their solution is wrong or the area they're picking on is, is wrong, but there may be a problem. They're bumping on something. No, 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 no note comes from nowhere. Um, there's something that, that um, there's something that's not working. And the other thing about notes, which I think is great is it's like every director, every screenwriter after the first draft, they generally tend to think it's, pretty damn good um, I mean some people are insecure don't but and and often what you need is someone to look at it and go actually this isn't the greatest thing I've ever written and, and and almost the electric shock of realizing it's not as good as you thought it was sort of motivates you to write the next draft because otherwise it's really hard if you think you've written something perfect you're never going to be able to write the second draft um, and, and so for me it's always been a process of getting notes having a totally sleepless night, being depressed about how bad it is and how much I need to do and whatever. And then somehow the next day I get up and write and then get excited again. That's really good advice. Um, do you have a, a, like a, a dream project or a novel that you've always wanted to adapt or like an original screenplay in your back pocket? Um, not, not really, because I think, I think I sort of feel that I sort of fall in love with projects as I'm writing them um, and they become a dream as I'm sort of, so it starts off being, you know, a bit of research, whatever. And, 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 and it's the more I get into it and the more I research it and the more I sort of, I guess, fall in love with the characters and the plot and the emotional things that surprise you, it becomes a dream. I, th I think, I think there's no, I'm probably scared of the ones I like too much um, that I sort of think, well, um, and also, it's always the next one's a dream one anyway. When you when you have when you work in the, this business, it's it's like, you know, the last one didn't work, but the next one's a dream one, so it's going to be the one that you know is going to be great. Very positive way to look at it. Um, it's we have to be because it's like there are so many downs in in the business that, that you just, it, it, you got, I mean, it, and, and you know, going back to advice of first time, you know, screenwriters, it, it's you've got to just be have a really tough skin because and and. And the rejections are just part of it, and the failure is part of it, and the bad reviews are part of it. Um, and you just have to get strong enough to carry on. I, th I think the worst thing is if any of those things stop you and getting stop you from getting up and writing the next morning, because mm. that, that's you know. yeah, definitely. To come back to your first screenplay, we we're wondering if you could give us a sort of quick summary about what it was that you told the story of and how you came across that subject and what intrigued you about it, of dying the light, the dying of the light. So, so I, I didn't, uh, I, the director approached me, a guy, a director called Peter Kosminski, who, who does a lot of docudramas and stuff. And, and he, he, he sort of, he had a huge team of researchers and stuff. And, and I struggled with the genre because I, I sort of, I'd come from being a huge movie fan obsessed with, you know, films really. So I, I wanted to take the story and turn it into a, a movie, which meant sort of fictionalizing sort of much more than I think Peter wanted to. And we had one, there was one huge, I mean, because it, it was about an aid worker who was killed, um, who was killed in Somalia. And I, I sort of, my, my sort of fictional kind of brain wanted to turn, because he, he just took extraordinary care of children when he was out there and did so much for the kids and kids loved him. And the whole story was about at the beginning so I, I just love the irony of him being killed by a child a child assassin um but peter did his research and the guy was in his 20s and i was like he can be fucking so so we had a huge argument about 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 what was true and i would 
argue that actually he's fictionalizing what he wants to fictionalize and relying on the truth when he wants to. So it actually becomes, it's a tricky genre because you're, you're, always, you're always cheating a little bit. Yeah, that's interesting. I would have thought it would almost be the other way around, that maybe you as a sort of screenwriter would want to stick more closely to the original sort of story. But no, it's just, I think storytelling is just, I think it's finding the story in the original. I mean, and, and the thing is, you know, everyone's, if you, if you try to tell screenplays everyone's life, it would be kind of dull. Whereas I think if you can find the story tropes and the universal themes and, and those ideas in their lives, which is how I think all these biopics work, is, is you, you're really taking, um, taking classical stories and imposing them on people's lives. Um, they're not really their real everyday lives. And there's, you know, you're, not, you're not telling it when they're sitting down and sort of thinking for three hours. No, definitely. Do you have any, from that first screenwriting experience, do you have any sort of fond memories or sort of difficult stories that, of things that didn't go quite well? I have one, one great, great, uh, which is very, Pete, Pete will be very angry with me for saying this story, but um, he, uh, it was the days before computers and cut and paste and whatever. So, well, maybe, maybe they did have them, but his help, actually he took my screenplay and he took his scissors and some glue and he had blank pieces of paper and he would literally <laughs> scissor the scenes and replace, change them in order. I remember just being so furious. Um, but he was, that was, that was, that was the one story I remember from there. Moving on to Jude, how did it feel to move from The Dying of the Light onto Jude? And did you feel any pressure in adapting like, such a classic? Um, no, I was just so thrilled to be doing I mean, it's funny because TV when I started wasn't like it is now. So Dying of the Light was a TV movie and, and to suddenly do a feature film was just such a huge, and that's what I'd always watched and loved. And, and so I was just thrilled to be doing it. And I, I wasn't, I was probably young enough not to be scared. Um, and it was great because actually one of the stories I remember from that is the, uh, the, the day we had to sign off as a screenwriter, you have to sign off the rights at the time you did anyway. And, they came round with the thing that the, I can remember someone, some career came around with something and there was a slot for my name to sign and one for Thomas Hardy underneath. So I think they, they hadn't quite figured out, I think it might have been the friend and just some distributor from some country hadn't, hadn't realised that he was no longer with us. That's amazing. Um, did your sort of like theatre experience in Oxford prepare you for this or? Was it a completely new learning on the job experience for that? Well, it, it, no, it, it did in the sense that I think because I, I did some acting as well as directing. And I, th I think for that reason, the idea of being able to imagine scenes playing and particularly, um, I tend to love quite intimate emotional scenes and the idea of like, say, pauses. I was a huge Pinter fan when I started. So the idea of, you know, the pause and what pauses can do and, and how much what's not said is, is as moving, as powerful, as offensive as what is said. Um, and, and, and so that, that really came from an interest in theatre. And, and, and I, I, still, I, I still prefer screenplays without a huge amount of you know, dialogue because I think when, when we talk, it's, it, I mean, what, again, what's interesting about cinema is, is you know, I can say something hurtful to someone but what's more interesting is the look on their face when they turn away from me than what I've said, in my opinion. Um, the, 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 those, those moments are what I'm more interested in, those are the silences that come out as a result of, of dialogue as opposed to the dialogue itself. Um, but, that, but that's what I prefer. There are people like, you know, Tarantino, his dialogue is so extraordinary that you can just hang on every word, um, but it's a different kind of writing. How closely did you work with the director, Michael Winterbottom? Was it a collaborative process or? Um, actually, you know, because it, it, it was my first experience, it was really strange. So I thought it would always be that easy. I, I wrote two drafts and he just said, this is great, I'm going to go away and shoot it. So, um, and it got made pretty much within a few months of me handing in this. It, it just happened really, really quickly. And I, I got very spoiled and assumed that, that everything would always be that easy and not realising that you know, you have issues with directors and then the studio comes and changes everything and this happens and that happens and 
never gets made. And, and so that was a bit, but I think, no, I, I didn't have a huge, he, he gave very detailed written notes. Um, and we, we'd obviously meet and talk about them, but I, I think he, he, he sort of left me to, to, to sort of alone when I was writing quite a lot. Um, in that respect, did you have any input in casting or did you write with Kate Winslet in mind? Or no, no, Kate, Kate Winslet was, um, I was actually, I was that, no, I wasn't there, but I, there, Kate Winslet was, I saw her screen test. She wasn't that well known at the time. I mean, I think she'd done have any creatures, but she, and I think she'd, she'd been cast and was doing Sense and Sensibility, but no one had really seen it. Um, but I remember seeing her screen test and just being absolutely blown away. Um, and, and, you know, my only involvement was to tell Michael, I think, what do you already know? He's, oh my God, this, this, this guy is just amazing. Um, and yeah, it was one of the most extraordinary things I've seen in her screen test. She just absolutely put a nail on it. Amazing. Um, to move on to The Wings of the Dove, how did you become involved in the project? Um, I got involved because I got, I got sent the book and I went to meet the original director, um, I can't remember his name now, but he, he didn't want me and it was so clear that he didn't, he had somebody else in mind and I just, I just find it was a horrible experience of just being kind of slightly deliberately humiliated to, 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 to sort of, you know, to get rid of you. And then it sort of went away for about four or five months and then um and they changed directors and ian soffy who's who's a wonderful director and has been a really close friend of mine ever since came on and we got on really well and so um i started writing it for him and it was it was an absolute joy um, and when you say that you got sent the book does do you often get sent books by directors or you know sort of family that, that, that book came from my agent and, and and one of the things i remember really clearly was i didn't really get into the book until the very last scene. Um, and the very last scene, sorry to give it away, but it's um, th these two people who've, who've sort of conspired to defraud this dying girl of her money by making the girl fall in love with the, the, the man and their couple. Um, she's dead, they've got the money, but in the mean, you know, in the act of betraying and seducing her, he's fallen in love with the dead girl. And so the whole thing is, is, is this extraordinary breakup scene in, in the book where these two people who started in love and committed this sort of virtual crime by, by, you know, and now they can't be together because that ghost, her sort of, you know, the memory of her is in the way. And for some reason, when I read that scene, it instantly just struck me. This feels like such a sort of, Sort of post-coital kind of breakup, you know, post bad sex, point, you know, post good sex, whatever breakup. But it felt like it was a sex scene, or all the extension of a sex scene. And so that got me really excited. And I remember pitching it to the first director, and he was just like, "You've got to be out of your mind." And then Ian totally got it, and it was, it really was what my guide through the whole screenplay. It's sort of almost working backwards from there is that notion of how you can corrupt love and, you know, that, that, you know, that notion of that love is a very, very fragile, precious thing. And you can, you can make mistakes along the way that can absolutely destroy something very valuable. Mm. And the screenplay was nominated for an Academy Award. So it must've felt great that, you know, even though you've been rejected by the director the first time round, you'd then been recognized. How did it feel to be recognized in this way by the industry? It was, no, it was, it was, well, it was fantastic. And it was, it also, I mean, I was, I was 32, so I was quite young at the time. It was all a bit, and I sort of thought it would be that, it would be, again, it's one of those things where you think it's going to happen all the time. So I probably didn't appreciate it as much as I should have done. Um, but it takes a lot of pressure off in the sense that, I, th I think having, being, it, 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 I mean, as, as I've sort of got older, I think the work is what's really important. I mean, nominations or whatever, it's all great. Um, and maybe I wouldn't have felt that way if I hadn't got nominated that young. But, but I, I just sort of think, you know, you've got to do the best work you can. And if, 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 it's, if it's sort of, you know, recognised, great. And, and if it's not, 
you tend to kid yourself and go well in 10 years time or in 15 years time or when I'm dead someone's going to watch it and like it so you, you kind of play those games with yourself but I think no it's, it was a fantastic experience but I think the danger is to fall into that trap of writing movies to get nominated and there's a certain kind of film that tends to do that so you know that would put me off writing a horror film or a, you know sci-fi film because there are certain things that generally get nominated less but that that's not um you know it was no it was it was, it was a wonderful experience yeah. and what was the award season like for that film well, we we the award season i was at we lost every my my category was um we quite rightfully lost to la confidential which was an amazing screenplay and i recommend anyone who hasn't seen it to watch it so it was probably the best adaptation of it. Uh, you know, for many years, um, but but it was it was great fun, and I, I sort of knew we weren't going to win because they were the favourites, so I could relax. Um, apart from the ceremony itself, where I think it was Walter Matthau was reading out the names, and he stumbled, he went, and the winner is, and he hesitated as if he was having a real problem reading the name, and I thought, God, how many? They've all got really easy names. I'm the only one with a weird name. And then, unfortunately, it was Brian Helgeland, and he couldn't pronounce <laughs> Helgeland. So, uh, yeah, so it wasn't to be. Good story, though. <laughs> <laughs> Close. Um, on to the next movie. How did you become involved in Drive? In Drive? Um, God, Drive was a studio film um, that I originally started writing for Universal, uh, and it was for... Hugh Jackman was the producer and he was originally supposed to star in it. Um, but the problem, the problem with it was that the idea that A, someone as sort of handsome as Hugh Jackman, but also someone in his 40s had never was this sort of guy who'd never really had any experience of the world and whatever, just felt very tricky. So I struggled a little bit with that. Um, then then I think at some stage he, he very graciously thought this isn't for me just just you know just write it and, and and then I wrote wrote a couple of drafts for the studio and then I think they found it too dark so it sort of went into it went into sort of what they call turnaround um, and in the meantime Mark Platt who is a very influential producer in in Hollywood showed it to Ryan Gosling who he was friends with and Ryan sort of came on but actually he weirdly went back to my he wanted to go back to the first draft because what, what often happens with with a draft particularly when you write for studio is they want more they want to understand so they want to know why the character did this and why so, so there was one draft which got very very bloated and, and had way too much dialogue and my original draft had been you know what i loved about the book is you didn't know very much about this person and i'd always loved um one of my favorite films had been a novel film called the samurai and, and you know literally nothing about the character apart from he's an assassin. And I just, I'd always loved that kind of man with no name kind of hero. So Ryan wanted to go back to that, which is what we did. And, uh, and then Nicholas, he brought Nicholas Raffin on um, because he, there were actually two directors Ryan was interested in and, and, and it ended up going to Nick. And then there was a fantastic process of working the great thing about Nick was he was absolutely so confident in himself that he was very, very happy for me to talk to the actors about the parts and stuff like that. And he would take me on location, sort of racky, so that I could see where he'd be filming and stuff. So the screenplay really revolved around production. I sort of got addicted to that process a bit in the sense that so the actors would turn up and I was living with them in LA for a while and in the same house. So the actors would turn up and you know, give me often quite brutal notes. Um, and there was one really interesting note, which is which is kind of a useful screenwriting tip is almost every actor was obsessed with their opening line, their entry into the story, depending on how big or how small their part was. I think the moment they understood who they were when they came into the story, it was much easier for them. Um, so, so there were lots of notes like that, or for example, I mean, Ryan Gosling himself had a, there was some issue we were having and uh, about some line of dialogue that I really liked and he wasn't sure about it. So this is really important. And his thing was, you know, what you have to understand is, is that you've written something on the page, which I now have to inhabit as a human being. And I have to bring something myself to it and whatever. And actually 
that that was a sort of eureka moment for me um, as a screenwriter with actors because before then I'd, I'd generally been a bit protective of lines so if someone would sort of change something I'd go oh you know that you've lost everything that little and instead of there is making it uh, but then I sort of realized that there's something about what they actors bring as human beings um, and not just performers to a part um, that, that turns something two-dimensional on a page into something three you know, it comes totally three-dimensional and they inhabit that part and so when I was directing for example I'd written a scene where I had Oscar Isaac's character lying on a bed being depressed and he goes I don't do that he goes I don't I don't lie on the bed when I'm depressed I pace I, I just need to be active the whole time so I rewrote the scene with that in mind and and again that's that's the truth that an actor will bring and, and so often the part that starts off on paper that hopefully evolves into becoming a mixture of what you've written and who that actor is as well as what they bring to it and then it suddenly comes alive um, and so that's why I think it's it's the screenplay is really a blueprint uh, and it just hopefully grows into something much better and, 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 and would drive that process Nick was very very good at, at allowing that process to evolve because he was not insecure about the relationship between writers and everyone else on the crew. It sounds incredibly collaborative. Do you think that is kind of like your ideal situation? Well, it, well, it was an ideal, and, and, and oddly, I had a, I had, I had a completely the opposite thing very soon after that, working with the director who absolutely didn't want me anywhere near the actors or the set. And, and, and I think the writing suffered because it never went through that evolution restage, which happens in rehearsals and the beginning of production and meetings and people just getting excited. You know, sometimes a production designer can give you a fantastic idea for a scene. They can suddenly go, what if you set that, you know, what if it was raining outside or whatever, and we, we can get a rain machine there and do that. And, and there's, there's all sorts of things that other people can bring to the process, even the writing process. And a good director, I think, will give everyone the freedom to contribute and ultimately it's going to be their movie mm -hmm. uh, and they'll claim it but why not use everyone else's great ideas that's very true um going back to the original writing process the novel had a non-linear narrative how did you sort of approach that challenge and adapt it um again that gave me freedom it was a bit like the henry james um so if, with the henry james novel that there, there were great characters what I, what I loved about James Salas's writing in Drive was atmosphere. Uh, and he sort of created this, this, this world of dingy cafes and, and lonely people. Uh, and it was, um, it was a bit like, um, is it Hopper, those paintings, which those, those very American, um, very lonely, you just get a real sense of Edward Hopper's paintings of, of, of you know, and he, he sort of really created that where he, he'd spend a whole paragraph writing about driver drinking a cup of coffee. And, and so he, even though it was, it was nonlinear and there was, it was quite different. Um, I think we were really true to the tone of it. Um, I mean, Nick, Nick brought the sort of, it's funny because I, I sort of, I was obsessed with 70s crime for, you know, Mel, you know from Melville through to those, um, those sort of cop, you know, driver kind of movies and criminal movies of the 70s. But Nick, the, the genius I think Nick brought to it was his obsession with 80s movies like Pretty in Pink and all those whatever. And so he sort of brought this um, sort of neon 80s music sort of whatever, electro whatever, to, to what was a kind of hard boiled 70s crime thriller. And I think that, that sort of really worked quite well in that piece of too. I was going to say, he has like a very distinctive style throughout his, like visual style throughout his films. Was that like something that you discussed between you that you put into the script? Um, yeah, so there, there would be some scenes where um, he had a very clear visual idea of what he wanted, but there, but there were moments they weren't really seen. So for example, there, there's, a, there's a scene where the camera's moving when the bad guys are all there and there's a scene where he slows it down and drivers looking through a window through a bit of a door at them so that he absolutely sort of and he would convey how he sort of wanted it so quite often you know that those beats but but the idea of no i think he brought a lot of those things 
you know, the, 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 the color, you know, the color palette and everything was something he discussed with the director of photography. But we did, I remember watching a lot of horror films with them at the time, you know, these sort of really sort of exploitation horror movies from the 70s and, and just not getting why he was, and being quite panicked actually, thinking why is, why is he, why is he, this is nothing like our movie, why is he watching these? And, and actually the color palette, some of it came from those slightly gaudy, um, you know, movies, those horror movies that he'd been watching. So I began to see how it all kind of came together in a sort of film. Move on to your directorial debut, uh, The Two Faces of January. You mentioned earlier that you'd always wanted to be a director. How did the opportunity to direct come about and sort of what made you decide to take it up? Uh, well, it was actually something that it, it took me so many years to get made because, well, for two reasons. One is, I think, in the industry, once you're established as a writer, people want you to stay as a writer. They don't, they'll kind of go, oh, well, we want you to write the script, but we'd much rather this famous director or that person there directs it. So, so it's very hard to persuade them to let you do it one. And, 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 and then also there's other job opportunities, you know, come up. So suddenly, you know, you're on the verge of getting this made in a big studio, you know, well paid and you can get distracted. So I think I got, I got distracted, but the reason the film got made was because simply because Viggo Mortensen read it and liked it. And we met in Madrid and we'd been really good friends ever since, but it's just one of those meetings that absolutely clicked. Um, but he was, without him, the film would never have gotten made because I needed a movie star. Uh, and I needed a movie star who would say, I want to do it with this director. And then once he was on board and we went out with him, and he's also what he's brilliant at is, he championed that film from the beginning when we were trying to raise money to, he did every radio show and interview. I mean, he's just such an amazing professional in that sense um, that, that he was really my partner on that film. And then, so that's why, that's how it got made. And I think, you know, having a relationship with an actor, so many particularly tricky films like Highsmith is quite dark and difficult and whatever. You know, if you look at a lot of those films that you think, well, how did that get made? It's often because of a relationship between, you know, a director and, you know, a lot of Brad Pitt, for example, I think gets a lot of films made that wouldn't normally get made just because he's a movie star and he will suddenly take some dark subject matter and, and really go with it. Mm -hmm. There's a few of them who do that. Were there any directors who took sort of particular advice from or even do you have any directors who you're heavily influenced by? Um, who directed? I, not, not on, um, well that, that film, it, I, was, I was really influenced by Anton Yeni. I love his sort of all his 60s Italian stuff and, and um, Aventura particularly. And, 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 and I sort of wanted to shoot it in quite a 60s style. So I watched a ton of movies from that period. Um, and um, directors here, directors, well, in, initially, Anthony Mangello was the producer on it before he very sadly passed away. So, so there were some early discussions with him. And, and um, what, what I sort of learned from I mean, he, he, he was so generous in terms of, I think, I think he had that ability to be very modest and, 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 and that meant people would kind of give him ideas. They didn't feel threatened. Um, and, and so that was it, was, it was mainly behavioral stuff that I sort of advice that I took on board when I was directing in the sense of first time director, don't pretend you know everything because you're gonna get found out. Um, you know, have enough confidence in what you bring to it and it helps if you've written the script um, to, to, to allow other people um, to, to kind of jump in with ideas and stuff. I mean, occasionally you have to then be tough because some people will abuse that and you don't want to be seen as weak but if, if, you, if you can get people to give you their best, you've got two, 250 people working on a film set. That's a lot of brains. Um, and the idea that it's all just you, it's, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, that's great advice though, to you know, keep, keep moving with the advice that you keep, get given. And, yeah. um, when you were filming in uh, Greece and Turkey, do you have any favorite sort of scenes or locations that you were 
shooting in or any particular memories? I mean, the whole, it was, it was such a dream shoot in the sense that we got to go to Crete by the beach for weeks and then Istanbul, which at the time was amazing. But my favorite was probably, we were the first film I think in quite a long time that had been allowed to shoot at the Acropolis, um, which, which had its problems in that, in that we had to, you know, we couldn't keep tourists away. So we could literally shut, shut it down for about, you know, have a piece of rope keeping them away for two or three minutes. And very occasionally you'd get some angry tourist going, oh, screw this film, I don't give up, whatever, and walk into a shot and whatever. But, um, but at the end of the day, I remember when everyone was leaving and whatever, I, I literally had the whole of the Acropolis to myself. And I was just, just couldn't, you know, just about, you know, for an hour, I just walked around on my own thinking, this is never going to happen again when you get that sight. Um, just to, you know, just himself. Um, so that was, that was, a, that was a really memorable one. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I wish I could do that. <laughs> yeah. In terms of, uh, like, the future, what do you think the future of TV or film will hold um, after post-corona? Well, I think TV streaming is going to do really well. And I think it was going that way. So I think it's only going to help that process and lots of TV shows. But I do, I do think, oddly, I think there's something about not being allowed to go to the cinema, which hopefully will make people kind of go, that was pretty special. And now that we miss it, we won't take it quite as much for granted because I think it was slipping away a bit. But I, but I think suddenly that notion and, and almost the challenge of getting people back into cinemas and that being part of a healing recovery process I think may help cinema in, in the sense that suddenly it, it gets a second chance to shine when right now TV and streaming are dominating so much. That's true, actually. Um, do you have any future projects that you can talk about? Um, I, can, I can't tell you that. I mean, I'm working on a musical and a sci-fi uh, movie, so those are the two. Um, but, but one's quite a big brand, so I'm not, I'm not being precious about it. I just, I'm literally not to talk about it. Really. It's, um, I'm really enjoying doing two really different genres at the same time. Um, yeah, sounds so exciting. Yeah, really? it's fun. Actually, see. musicals I've never even done before, so it's actually a real, a real love. But I, I, I kind of, again, yeah, as a film geek, I love different genres so much that, that as a film musical is one I haven't done. I really want to do a horror film in the Western as well. So, very so, cool. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. Um, soon we're going to have some questions from the audience, so please type your questions into the Q&A box and we'll read them out. Um, but while we're waiting, we're going to ask our final question, and that is, do you have any TV or film recommendations to film our lockdown summer? I actually really enjoyed the, um, the Spike Lee movie, The Five Bloods. Mm. Um, that was something I watched in lockdown. I mean, The Last Dance, which you've all, everyone's seen, so I really adored that. Um, uh, I'd say I quite got into actually last year I, I ruptured my Achilles so I was I was sort of bed bound for a while and I watched tons and tons of Korean cinema um, which I really recommend. I know every you know with Parasite it's suddenly become quite fashionable but there are some fantastic sort of crime films um, that 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 you know they're hunting those out. I think that's quite um, yeah no. Uh, and TV shows. I, I'm, not, I'm also watching a lot more documentaries than I normally do. Um, I just, I just find I don't know for some reason, you know, whether it's sports or music documentaries. Um, there's the, the great, um, the Bob Dylan, Scorsese one was great. Um, I watched a really good one on David Bowie's Rise to Fame, which was on BBC last week, I think. Oh, cool. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, music documentaries. Perfect, thank you. Um, we've got a question here from Tristan Griffin saying, um, as a historian, have you ad enjoyed adapting one particular period more than any others? Yeah, I loved, I really loved researching um, a, a TV show that I worked on called The Alienist, um, and that was set in 19th century New York. And and it was it was a really seedy underbelly of, of 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 New York, but it also involved, you know, the you know the Lower East Side and and you know the Jewish community, the immigrants who'd come over. So that story I found absolutely fascinating. Um, 
and it was such a mix of different, um, you know, this, this sort of mix of, you know, culture and violence and a new city going up and building and progress um, that I found that absolutely fascinating to research. And then well, probably I must have read about 40, 50 books on it because there's so many things written about it too. Wow. Yeah, I guess time travel. Yeah, it is time travel. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Um, our next question is from an anonymous attendee, and they ask, "How far do you think directing can go to make unnatural dialogue seem natural?" Possibility. Um, I think it's a combination of directing and and also acting, because I think I think there are some actors that can just make any line. They can, you know, a good actor can make you look fantastic. Uh, and a bad actor can make you look absolutely dreadful over exactly the same line. And I, th I think one example I always think of with this is there's um, a, a very famous scene in Heat where Al Pacino and Robert De Niro uh, have their one conversation. I think there was, an, there was another version of almost word for word the same scene that was done in the TV version of it, sort of, I think 10, 15 years before. Um, I can't remember the name of the TV film, but it was. Um, and it was absolutely atrocious. And I think so, some of it was because <coughs> Michael Mann sat them face to face, um, whereas the other one had them sitting side to side in the barn. Mm. So that's the, um, <coughs> that's the um, directing. But, but I think, yeah, with naturalism, I, th I think an actor can just somehow, it, it's amazing to me what they can do. But also where you stick a camera can help. Um, so if, if, if if, if the shot feels emotional, the line can sometimes feel emotional, even if it's unnatural. And, and I think the close-up particularly is one of those things that is really under, you know, is a director's skill that's really underrated. Um, I mean, in uh, normal people, I just think some of the, I mean, some of the, some of the close-ups on particularly Lenny Abramson's early episode I just thought were genius. And, and it's not, and it's, that's a combination of performance and, and where the camera's put and the use of music and everything kind of working together. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we've got a question here from Sefa Dahl, um, who asks for any examples of outstanding scripts you would recommend to anyone who's interested in writing or script editing. Uh, if you could get hold of them, um, I, I, I think the Schindler's List script is amazing, uh, Steve Zalian. Um, I think anything he writes, he's, he's a screenwriter that on the page is absolutely brilliant to read. Um, then the classic one is Chinatown, which is quite easy to get hold of. Robert Town, um, the screenplay um, is really good. There's another one I love, which is the uh, Lawrence of Arabia screenplay, because what, what that does, and one, of, one of the things it taught me was Nowadays, more and more people encourage you, encourage you not, as a screenwriter, not to write visually what's going on. Whereas with that screenplay, everything visual is written down. And, and, and that, for me, is a much more exciting way of writing because you can't see it at all sometimes. You know, there's a, um, so those three, um, I mean, the Damien Chazelle script of La La Land, I really like. He, didn't, he doesn't write the songs in, but I read that preparation for a musical but but it captures emotion really well um, yeah there's so many sites now that have screenplays there's I, I, is it I, the internet script movie database ismb where literally i think it's got the biggest thing of free downloads of uh, you know screenplays and i, I think any screenplay is worth doing. um in that respect there's a, a question from abdel balabis who asked when writing a screenplay with little dialogue, such as Drive, what techniques do you use to express characterization instead of dialogue? Um, well, I, I, do, I do something which is, again, it's one of those things that kind of those screenwriting books tell you not to do, which is to sort of hint at the motion or reaction. Um, so I will, I will often, like, even in a dialogue scene, so the pauses and, you know, there are long pauses and drive, but sometimes they're scripted and, and, and it's sort of in a sense that you kind of go, she holds his gaze a moment or she turns away, thinks and whatever. And I think those, those however, so what if a shorthand that is, is sort of saying, this is a moment of reflection or contemplation or whatever. And, and so those, those moments of 
you know, describing some form of interiority, I do. People tell you don't write anything you can't show, but I don't know. I, I think the read is very important too, and it's important for the actor reading it, the studio, the director. So, so I, I think sometimes you can use novelistic kind of techniques of, of slightly getting, you know, description of a room, for example, or whatever. I mean, yes, like I say, the production design will do what they want, but you're, you're creating mood and you're creating tone. And, and that is, is part of silent storytelling. So for example, the, the, the car chase scene in Driver is on, on the page, the beginning, the very big opening scene is about five or six pages of dialogue. So there's one line which I think it described a police car crossing, I can't remember what it was, but it was a bit like a shark sort of just emerging and disappearing. And that, that says, okay, it's moving quickly and crossing quickly. And it's those sort of things. You can convey some idea of what it'll look like. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question here from Claire Walsh who asks, how have you found writing during lockdown? And do you have any advice to help stop procrastinating? Um, yes, I think, I think I, I've had such a routine for so many years that lockdown was relatively easy for me in the sense that I, I've, I've always got up at seven. I mean, got started writing seven, seven thirty, um, and finished around one and the reason one or two and the reason I did that um, after five hours, I tend to lose, get a bit of snow blind and tend to sort of really fixate on a line or a moment and that, that's, that I'll spend, I'll waste four hours rewriting a single line of dialogue just because I'm tired and I've worked too, too hard. So I, I think having it, for me at least, some people don't do this, but for me, you know, a regular routine helps because you don't really, you know, don't get writer's blog, just get up and write, even if you're, you know. The other thing is I tend to do in, in the afternoons when I'm not actually writing, I'll tend to plan for the next day and, and sort of have some idea. So because the scariest thing is to get up, go to your oh, to computer and, and, and not know what you're going to write. Whereas if I put a few notes on, you know, or a few couple of lines of maybe a line of dialogue like this or some vague structure of a scene, even if I don't end up using it, I've got a map, a sort of little map to start off the next day. Then there's a famous Hemingway trick, which is, you know, leave off writing at the point where you want to carry on. So if you sort of go, I really want to write this next scene, make yourself stop and start. So the next day you were excited about it again. So there's all sorts of tricks and stuff. And, and, and sort of for that reason, I, I don't think the lockdown particularly affected my writing process because it stayed the same. And, and instead of maybe having meetings and whatever and this, I could go for walks. Which is more fun. Sounds lovely. Yeah. Uh, Tanya Brown asks, how do you get scripts noticed and made into films? And do you have any advice for young screenwriters? Yeah, I, the script notice thing is, it's sort of out of your hands. So what I would say is when you're ready to send something out, just get straight on to the next one because it's slightly numbers game. And, and, and if you've got four scripts out there, one is likely to, to, you know, I think the danger is to write your perfect script, send it out and then wait. Because unfortunately this industry, the waiting takes a very, very long time. And people often don't read, they don't get back to you waste your time um, and and so you know creatively the more personal it is the more, I think the more unique it'll be I think I think I think I've always felt that about writing is whatever genre you're writing if, if you can draw on kind of raw experiences that you they're almost confessional you know, if you in a sci-fi film if you suddenly put a moment that you remember from your childhood of course you felt pain that suddenly makes that thing stand out more than something you're borrowing from every other TV show you've watched, uh, which is the, the first go-to point. You sort of go, oh, well, what's the obvious thing is that? And then you kind of go, well, I remember, you know, walking in on my parents and having a huge argument and then this happened and that happened and I went to the bathroom and knocked myself in or whatever. And suddenly in totally different, in a period drama or whatever, you're taking it and putting it in a different world, but it still has something that feels true. And I, th I think the more you can call on that, the more your script will feel personal and then just keep writing and getting them out there. Um, and, and it's quite nice to know there's one out there while you're working on the other one, so there's something, something nice. Mm. Uh, 
Well, I think I think that's all we have time for, but those were perfect words to end on. Um, thank you so much, Hussein. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's really fun. Answers and thank you for giving us your time. And thank you, everyone who joined the call and asked amazing questions. Brilliant. Thanks Please do like us. our Facebook page for more updates and remember to register for our next Q&A with actor Hattie M Morahan on Tuesday, June 30th at 6pm. Thank you so much again. Thank you.